show with me and um, Barbie puts in another appearance. Um, well, that's probably because it was a Canadian episode of the show. Yes, that is indeed correct. Um, as you probably can see from the title page, we are, or I am, <laughs> we are, or the royal we, uh, are doing a 100% Canadian episode of the show. Ooh, no, that's a first. <laughs> no Anglo-Canadian, no um, American-Canadian. It is 100% Canadian. So, in honour of that, wearing my um, uh, Moving Pictures limited edition t-shirt, which doesn't get worn very often because, as you can see, it has sleeves. Um, anyway, we're not here to talk about music. Um, but uh, w what we are here to t talk about is obviously um, Canadian spirits. And we have... Uh, quite a range of spirits to taste this afternoon. So um, basically, let's let's have a look at, uh, at what we will be tasting at uh, or the distillery. So um, I've got the new two new releases from um, two brewers. Uh, their Yukon single malt. Obviously, as you know, two brewers uh, is a distillery and uh, or formerly was a brewery. And still is a brewery as far as I'm aware, founded in, I think it was 1997 in Yukon, uh, Canada, and um, I think it was in 2009 they installed uh, a still, or stills in the plural, and decided to sort of branch out into distilling whiskey, and so each release is uh, a small batch release, and they do... Um, I believe, uh, was it three, two ranges, uh, three ranges in actual fact, they did the classic, uh, the innovative, which as the name suggests, um, is generally speaking a little bit quirky in somehow or another, and, um, Barbie's cute to leave, and, uh, the other range is called cask finishes, uh, which again is pretty much self-explanatory, um, the other two distilleries which are completely and utterly new to me and the first time they have put in an appearance on the show are a, um, a distillery in Vancouver called Long Table. Now uh, this is a micro distillery that opened in February of 2013 and uh, was opened by a chap by the name of Charles, oh look it's a foreign name which I'm going to murder, um, Tremu, Tremuwen, um, I hope I pronounced that correctly, doesn't sound very French or Canadian, but there you go. Um, I don't suppose you have to have a French or Canadian sounding name to live in Canada. Um, so basically he, he decided that he wanted to, uh, he'd been involved I think in, in the food and drinks industry for, for a number of years and decided in 2010 that he wanted to build a distillery in Vancouver, which would have been the first uh, distillery uh, to be built in the city and uh, apparently as is often the case with uh, doing these kind of things was uh, well, I wouldn't say hamstrung but had obstacles to overcome shall we say and um, uh, essentially three years later he finally gets the distillery up and running and um, then it seems to me that uh, the, the Canadian uh, government, uh, for want of a better word, seems to be, you know, hell bent on throwing spanners in the works, as all governments have a tendency to do, really, don't they? At the end of the day, bloody bureaucracy. Um, and I mean, because as you know, Canada, uh, the whole um, spirits uh, sales uh, apparatus is controlled by the government, it's all run by the government, it's a bit like Sweden. And so basically if you have a distillery and you want to sell to the public, that's all well and good, you can do that, but you obviously have to pay a huge amount of money to the government uh, for doing so, you know, not like in this country where you pay your excise duty and your VAT. Oh no, you pay a shitload to them apparently. Um, uh, according to uh, the information I, I discovered, um, Originally, uh, the you, you, the commission um, that uh, the uh, the distillery received from selling their product was um, 30 percent. I mean, so seventy percent of the sale of your spirit is going to the government. God, I hope they're spending it well. Um, and uh, but but well, that's that's not all. But <laughs> in two thousand and fifteen, they cut it to five percent. I mean, what? 
it's the point in bothering to sell it yourself if all you're going to make is 5%. I mean, you're probably actually going to make more money selling it to the government for the government to sell in their in their stores, surely. But anyway, um, I guess it's a, a sort of a, a point of principle, I suppose, that, you know, when you want to visit a distillery, you obviously want a tasting. You don't want to turn up to a distillery and go, look, here's our wonderful stills, here's our great range of products, but you can't taste them. You know, that's really not going to help sales or marketing or any of that kind of thing in the slightest, really. Um, so, basically, long tables appear to, well, they, they do, they, they produce a series of uh, uh, white spirits, unaged spirits, and um, uh, apparently yet another uh, spanner was chucked in the works uh, when the Canadian government deemed that they could no longer call themselves a craft distillery. Now, that is because they... Uh, imported, well they didn't import, but they, they their um, grain spirit I believe um, was uh, or is um, sourced from all over Canada and uh, um, basically um, that's not in the Canadian government's uh, eyes craft distilling. So I suppose in one way it's kind of nice that you've got a legislative body that's trying to build some kind of framework around the use of the word craft, which, as you well know, I really don't like. It's a marketing term. It's frankly bollocks at the end of the day, because um, you can call every distiller craft. Because what does craft mean? Craft just means making. And so, you know, all distilleries make a product. They make whiskey or whatever. So therefore, all distilleries should be called craft. It's only the marketing idiots that decided we need to call it something different to sort of signify small and glass grain to bottle and boutique and all this kind of, oh God, I hate these terminologies. At the end of the day, you know what? Why don't you just call yourself a distillery? There you go. That's all you need to say. We are a small distillery. Can't, can't criticise you for that because it is entirely true. You are indeed a small distillery or you might be a large distillery as the case may be. Why not just basically say we are distillers. We distill spirits. We distill. You know, you can say like for example, we'll, we'll get onto Ironworks in a minute, but um, I, Ironworks basically set themselves up in uh, the town of uh, Lunenburg um, which is in Nova Scotia and their principal claim or one of their claims was to, to source as much of their raw material as you know within the locale as their website says made in Nova Scotia equals jobs in Nova Scotia which is laudable can't can't argue with that one at, at all but you know um, Coming back to the point I was making was, yes, all right, so you might not source all of your raw materials locally, um, but does that really matter at the end of the day? That, uh, as long as it's sort of, you know, um, a, a quality product, I, I, I think the sort of, you know, the, the sort of marketing terminology really is, at the end of the day, really irrelevant. Um, it's all about making a, making a quality product. And talking of... Um, well, talk, hopefully talking of quality product, I, I have tasted it, but I'm, I'm not going to let on. Um, the Ironworks, we're looking at uh, one of their bottlings. Uh, they seem to do you know, a number of different fruit-based um, spirits, I guess, uh, using apples, pears, grapes, raspberries and blueberries that are all uh, harvested and come from sort of Nova, the Nova Scotia area um, but what we are looking at is their rum um, and um, Nova Scotia as you know seafaring port city or town as the case may be and uh, um, so e even more a nod to the heritage uh, of the uh, of the area the, the distillery is actually right smack bang by the sea it's uh, um, they use a building that was originally uh, built in 1893 and was uh, originally a marine blacksmith's shop which created uh, iron fittings for the sailing vessels that were built in the town. Uh, the Ironworks Distillery, I'm, I'm guessing that like a lot of um, ports, the um, shipbuilding industries have moved 
kind of uh, to other locales, shall we say, and uh, I imagine that the building must have fallen into uh, disuse uh, as it was turned into the Ironworks Distillery in 2009. So, coming back to, again, their sourcing of raw materials, obviously they make rum from molasses, or well, I mean, you can use sugarcane juice and all that kind of stuff, but as far as I'm aware, sugarcane does not grow in Nova Scotia. <coughs> so it has to come from somewhere else. And indeed, it comes from Guatemala. And uh, it's apparently processed in New Brunswick before being shipped uh, or uh, delivered to the distillery. So, so there you go. That's a sort of potted history sort of information about the uh, the distilleries we're looking at today. Let's um, move on to the road. <laughs> Okay, so um, big range of, 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 of different spirits, which was a little bit of a conundrum to figure out which order to actually taste them in, but I think I've kind of sussed it. Uh, the first bottling we'll be looking at is the Long Table Texada Vodka, bottled at 40%. Long time since I've tasted a vodka. I mean, vodka sales have fallen off a cliff as far as I'm concerned. Um, what? <laughs> I sold a bottle at the weekend in actual fact, which I think was probably the first bottle in about a month. Um, anyway, so this is uh, pot distilled. Don't know how many times, uh, I'm guessing not very many. Um, but it's distilled with lemongrass, uh, which is quite interesting. And then it's polished, I'm assuming they mean filtered, um, although they don't want to use the term filtered, um, over a bed of Texada Island limestone. So kind of almost a bit like the other Canadian vodka, um, the Crystal Head, you know, Dan Aykroyd's vodka, and which is filtered through those crystals and all that kind of stuff. I mean, admittedly, I don't think they're, they're going down the mystical angle with this particular bottling, uh, just using natural limestone to um, filter uh, their vodka with. Uh, next bottling we'll be looking at is their London Dry Gin. Uh, this is a bottle of 44% and bug it if I can find out what, what uh, botanicals are actually in it, apart from eight, uh, one of which is juniper. Anyway, so uh, they don't really kind of give an awful lot away, to be honest with you. Um, don't know why they're hiding the recipe, but, well, you know, distilleries. Uh, so this is apparently one sort of, uh, a lot of um, medals in Vancouver and the cynic would say there's probably not a lot of distilleries or not a lot of competition in Vancouver. Um, I may well be wrong, please shoot me if I am, but uh, um, it's a bit like uh, the World Whiskey Awards where um, uh, Glen Kinchy keeps winning Lowland Whiskey of the Year. Well, it bloody well would do because it's the only one that ever gets entered. So it wins by default, even though it's bloody awful. Anyway, I'm not saying that the London Dry Gin is awful. Honestly, I'm not saying that. Um, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. And um, while we, we'll carry on, while we're talking about Long Table, I'm going to finish with, uh, you're probably thinking, why am I finishing with a white spirit? Well, this is an Akavit, uh, which uh, is a uh, Scandinavian um, liqueur, uh, liqueur, Scandinavian flavoured uh, alcoholic beverage. Um, and uh, this, this has six botanicals. Uh, it's a, a called Langbord uh, Akavit. Uh, Langbord apparently is Swedish uh, for Long Table. Oh, by the way, the name Long Table comes from literally Long Table. I believe that it was, uh, the idea was conceived amongst family and friends while eating and they all sat around a long table. So, why not? Um, anyway, so this has got six botanicals, uh, includes caraway, fennel, Anise and Seville Orange, so you can understand why I've put it at the end of the tasting. Uh, then, so coming back now, we're then going to look at uh, the two um, uh, Yukon Single Malts, the two brewers bottlings. The first one is uh, Release Number Nine, which is in their Special Finishes series, bottled at forty-six percent, and has been finished in ex Pedro Zimenez casks. And well, the colour is not too dark, so I'm hoping that it hasn't gone to overkill on the on the sherry. Um, this was uh, bottled in, uh, or released in, uh, April of 2018. So, 
although it's been out for a while, the samples only really have only just come to me. And 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 I would like to say a big big thank you to um, to you conspirators for you know sending me the samples all the way from Canada. That's really really nice. And uh, a big thank you to um, JBE. Uh, imports that that have just started importing the uh, the longboard and uh, incredible generosity in sending me full bottles when I just said just send me little samples and lo and behold full bottles turn up. Um, anyway, uh, I'm kind of jumping around a bit. <laughs> you know, um, hopefully that the, the tasting will go a little bit more smoother than uh, than than this presentation. Um, and uh, the next of the two uh, new releases from uh, the two brewers is release number ten. Uh, in their classic series, but this is the classic cask strength, their first cask strength release, uh, bottled at 58%, and uh, was released in um, July of this year. So that I think should be interesting, uh, as far as I'm aware, a aged wholly in American oak, as far as I'm aware. So that's that. And um, on to the ironworks now. Uh, this sample came courtesy of my uh, my good friend Shane Leahy. Thank you very much for that, Shane. Uh, really appreciate uh, that. Um, I obviously don't get the opportunity to taste very many uh, Canadian spirits, so it's always nice when uh, when someone kindly donates uh, a sample. So this is the Ironworks Blue Nose Rum, bottled at 42%. Uh, made from um, a base of um, Guatemalan, Guatemalan, Guatemalan. Um, uh, yeah, I think it was Guatemalan. Yes, it was indeed Guatemalan. I am indeed correct. Uh, molasses. So um, that should be quite uh, quite an interesting tasting, I think. And uh, yeah, so I'll leave the aniseed flavoured one till the very end. So um, well, I guess that's uh, that's enough waffle. I think you probably really want to know what this lot tastes like, don't you? Right, okay, so let's kick off with the uh, Texar vodka. Let's see what uh, the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Soft, creamy, slightly earthy. Uh, there's a definite kind of dried um, lemongrass kind of note, sort of, or, well, sort of, yeah, it, it is lemongrass. I mean, grassy sort of, you know. Um, I mean, it's it's pleasant. It's soft. It's easy going. It's got some character. Um, there's more of a an earthiness to it, which I, I think is is quite nice. It doesn't doesn't feel like it's been over distilled or over filtered. It's certainly got some some character, which I think is uh, is quite nice. So let's see what uh, what the palate's like. Soft, creamy, touch of spice, a little bit of spice on the finish. Um, again, the lemongrass kind of comes through. It's got that more dried lemongrass kind of character. Um, nice length, easy going, um, no rough edges. There's a maybe a slight starchiness to it. It's sort of, um, it certainly doesn't feel like um, an out and out sort of. Uh, rough grain spirit kind of vodka it has to be said it's got that lovely soft smoothness it feels more like possibly the base material might be wheat um, I don't honestly know but it's got that kind of softness that I've often found with with um, vodkas and um, white spirits that have tended to use that as their, as their base but uh, so um, yeah nice one to start with on. Right, okay, so let's move on to the London Dry. Let's see what the news gives us on this end, shall we? Pleasant, again, clean, um, slightly floral, nice dollop of juniper. Touch of spice, maybe slightly woody spice, possibly some cassia, maybe a bit of cinnamon, possibly some cardamom, licorice root, maybe. So, slight starchiness to the um, uh, to the spirit. I think it's 
I think it's just nicely balanced. It's quite subtle. Um, it's not a sort of big, in-your-face, weird and wonderful London Dry. It's quite classical, but it's got a, a nice fullness to it. Let's see what the power's like. soft, quite creamy, um, it kind of, yeah, it does, <laughs> it, uh, it kind of sort of starts off a little bit crisper, a little bit fresher, there's a little bit more juniper, um, I get a little bit of, of possibly cinnamon and, and coriander, uh, not coriander, um, cardamom uh, on, on the mid palate, there's also quite a floral note to it, which sort of reminds me a little bit of elderflower um, not entirely sure whether it is elderflower or not but it it reminds me of elderflower um, again it's got a slight sort of starchy sort of wheaty possible character um, it's it's long it's got a nice intensity yeah it's it's pleasant it's you know um, it's it's good yeah, the only drawback as far as I can see and it's nothing to do with the quality of the spirit is the fact that I do in the shop have a number of London dry gins and you know there's only enough shelf space for a few shall we say so you know if I wanted to add one I'd have to kick one out and you know I've got quite a few of the sort of local London dry gins and um but anyway, you know, I certainly wouldn't dissuade anyone from, from purchasing it and trying it because I think it is a, you know, it's, it's a pleasant gym. Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two uh, Brewers bottlings. This is uh, release number nine, the special finishes finished in PX casks. That's a lovely nose. Um... The sherry is not too heavy. It's kind of, you know, it's giving a little bit of sort of treacle, a little bit of, of dried fruit. But the thing I, li I like about the two brewers malts is the esteriness of, the, of it. You know, similar-ish to um, uh, to uh, MacMyra, in, in fact. And it has that sort of, you know, pineapple, apple, apricot, slightly tropically kind of character. And... Um, and it's still there, it's not been swamped by the sherry at all. And um, there's a, a little bit of melon as well, a little bit of soft spice, pepper. And all the while that sort of sherry note is sat in the background. It's adding a little bit of dried fruit, a little bit of treacle like I said. And um, that is just a really nicely balanced nose I think. Um, absolutely spot on as far as I can see. Let's see what the panel's like. Mouth filling, chewy, kicks off with a lot more of the sherry character. Um, dried prunes, plums, raisins, treacle, a bit of malt, a bit of cereal um, and then on the finish you start to get the, the actual spirit character coming through. Maybe not quite so tropical but it still has that estuary fruit character, that pineapple, apricot, a little bit of apple, soft spice, um, little bubble gummy I would say right on the finish um, which you could be if yeah, one is being overly critical um, I mean it's not a huge issue as far as I can see it's all kind of part and parcel of the character of the uh, of the whiskey and I suppose if you're going to sort of um, create quite an estuary style of, uh, of whiskey you can often sort of get that kind of slightly confected bubblegummy character coming through as long as there's plenty of other things going on to me it's not a huge issue if it was a dominating issue it would be an issue 
if you see what I mean. Anyway, um, what I'm trying to say is I think this is a lovely balanced whiskey. I really like this. Um, personally, I think I prefer the nose a little bit more to the palate, maybe, but I think it has a lovely progression. And certainly, as you well know, progression is something I look for in a whiskey. So absolutely big thumbs up to the distillery for that. Right, okay, so let's move on to release number 10, uh, the classic uh, car strength at uh, 58%. Now that's more my cup of tea, um, or um, that's my Canadian whiskey. Um, yeah, really, really fruity, really tropical, melon, pineapple, apricot, baked bread, um, toasty oak, touch of cereal, touch of malt, really intense, um, but still got that lovely softness to it, that roundness. Um, I'm not getting kind of alcohol overload although you know it's 58 percent i mean you know this is not exactly a you know a shiny and retiring whiskey it has to be said but oh that alcohol is just so so well integrated and often tends to be the way with these kind of more fruitier estuary whiskies they kind of seem to sort of you know mask i suppose the the, the alcohol uh, quite nicely um Getting really quite nutty now. Um, this is a stunning, stunning nose, it has to be said. Um, oh, and it's not very old at all. I mean, you know, we're talking young, but we're not talking fainty. Um, yeah, that's 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 very, very good. Let's see what the palette's like. Now the alcohol is noticeable on the palate, I can tell you. Um, a lot of oak, uh, a lot of nutty, toasty, vanilla, baked bread. Um, and it's kind of a little tight, but the fruit is still there. It's still got that lovely estery, fruity kind of character. Um, some lovely barley, it's got a lovely sweet finish, lovely sweet barley. Again, little bubble gummy, possibly. Um, a bit tight I'm guessing some water will probably open that up a little bit and would you know I forgot to actually fill the uh, fill the jug with water so I'm not going to put any water with it but um, that is a lovely whiskey again I mean really very very impressive um, and each time that I think uh, I taste um, the uh, the bottlings from, um, from two brewers each time I really really like them and and you know I think they have you know like I said I think there's a, a style that's not a million miles away from from Mac Myra in that sort of lovely estery kind of fruity style of whiskey and yeah I'm just a big fan of that I, that's what I like I mean I know everybody doesn't like that kind of thing I know that some of you that love the shall we say more industrial style of whiskey but to me this is just 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 a joy to drink absolutely fabulous right okay so let's move on to the blue nose the blue nose rum i mean look at that color of that will you i mean it's just black i mean you know how in god's name do they get it to that color without you know, the E150, you know, um, I mean, it's, it's like like liquid treacle or Pedro Zimenez, you know, so anyway, let's see what uh, what the nose goes. <laughs> that is not shy and retiring, I can tell you, that is a big, chunky, treacly, sort of dark fruit, molasses, spice, menthol, touch of eucalyptus, pepper oh, oh that's that's kind of a bit of a, a wakey wakey to the senses i mean if they'd have bottled this a cut strength you would be going oh, oh my god um do you know it does have a sort of I, mean, I would not be surprised if they have partially aged this in or wholly aged it in ex sherry cars because it does have 
a real sort of grapey kind of uh, character and it does remind me of Pedro Zimenez uh, matured um, spirits I, I mean I could be wrong on that but I, I, I don't get caramel I really don't get any caramel I don't get any flattening or deadening um, it's got a lovely lively nose so I can't believe that the distillery uses caramel um, so the colour has certainly got to come from somewhere and I'm guessing that it's got to come from the casks which would only mean one thing, sherry casks and um, it, like I said it, it, it kind of has that sort of kind of character and I think this is absolutely stunningly good um, I mean it's not particularly complex uh, shall we say, it's pretty simplistic and it basically sort of gives you everything almost in one go but you know that's off to it. <laughs> There's a lot of it. Um, let's see what the palettes are like. Now the palette is a bit lighter a bit more classically rum I suppose I'm getting dried through I'm still getting molasses I'm still getting that sort of sherry sweetness um, it's a bit short it's a bit simple again it's you know there's no real great complexity it basically gives you everything sort of there and then um, quite chewy uh, it's a sort of a slight wood smoke burnt wood kind of note there as well um, it's not too sweet. I think the, the, the alcohol is just, just, just right. Just to sort of um, add a crispness to sort of offset the molasses sweetness. Um, it's a session rum at the end of the day, I think. It's a kind of a rum you would probably, if you were going to have a bit of a rum sesh, you'd sort of kick off with something like that. You know, it's not particularly challenging. Um, but it's well made. It's got depth. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not bad. Right, finally, a bit of a palate cleanser. Let's, uh, let's do the yak of it, as they say. Um, let's see what the nose gives us. Anise, um, fennel, um, well, what did you expect? I mean, that's, you know, um, it's, it's clean, it's, it's fresh, it's clean, um, there's no dirtiness, oiliness, no faintiness, um, it's got, yeah, it is a, a, a sort of an aniseed flavoured spirit at the end of the day, and uh, the trouble is with, with aniseed or anise, fennel, that kind of stuff, you know, it is a very dominating kind of character, and um, there ain't an awful lot more you can say about it, apart from Yep, if you like this kind of stuff, then um, this is obviously not that bad. Anyway, let's see what the power's like. Again, it has a kind of quite wheaty, full, creamy, spirity character. Um, but again, it's aniseed, it's fennel, um, star anise. It's it, you know that's that's basically what what you're getting. It's it's a kind of a digestive. It's supposed to help the digestive system, and um, I'm guessing that those um, botanicals are ones that help the digestive system, I suppose. And um, although I've got no water, if you do put a little drop of water with it, uh, it does actually bring out the Seville orange notes, you do actually pick up the orange character, um, which you really can't taste when you're drinking it neat, but it's, it's again, it's a pleasant spirit, there's nothing wrong with it, um, it just does what it says on the tin, I suppose. Of the show. Um, just firstly, a big, big thank you to uh, everyone that uh, contributed samples for today's episode of the show. JBE Spirits, uh, two brewers, and to my good friend uh, Shane, thank you very much. Um, like I keep saying, without you guys supporting me with samples and you guys that watch the show, then obviously I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't be doing this. Um, I'd probably be doing something else. But anyway, this is what I enjoy doing. I love entertaining you guys. And, you know, I might, might make a complete idiot of myself from time to time. But, you know, um, I have that kind of sense of humour. So I uh, had a bit of a thick skin. So, uh, but thankfully, you guys don't tend to say too many negative things, which is kind of nice. Anyway, um, long table. Um, yeah, okay. Nothing wrong with the vodka. The vodka's quite nice. Um, and it's got some interest it's not just purely sort of alcohol and nothing else so so yeah I, I think that's that's quite pleasant the London Dry again I think it's quite nice um, it's certainly got some character to it uh, it's quite subtle there's there's a nice balance between spirit character and botanicals um, so so yeah if, uh, you know if, you, if you're into Canadian spirits and things like that then certainly you know go ahead and purchase it you know uh, the act of it yeah, that's what it says on the tin at the end of the day. Certainly nice spirit, good quality. Um, don't expect a great deal of complexity from something that's uh, yeah, essentially, you know, anise flavoured. So, um, so yeah, pleasant. Um, two brewers. Now, this is where, where I think we get kind of interesting. Like I said, uh, the number nine, really like that. Lovely balance, good use of sherry casks, hasn't swamped the character of their spirit, which I think is key. Um, love the nose a little bit more than I love the palate, but I think, you know, all told, if you can get hold of a bottle of it, you would certainly not be disappointed by it whatsoever. Um, and I don't think it's available in this country, but then they do bottle it in 75 CL bottles, which means they would have to um, bottle it in 70 CL bottles if they were going to export it. Yeah, but you didn't know that one, did you? Well, you probably did, but you probably didn't know that one. You Anyway, um, and um, uh, release number 10, the car strength bottling. Yeah, I'm spot on, absolutely spot on. Like I say, each time I, I sort of taste the, the, their spirit, each time I find that the quality is just getting better and better. Some of the earlier releases um, were a little bit on the spirity side, a bit too young. Maybe they're using a little bit more mature spirit in in these bottlings just to give it a bit more of a uh, a roundness a bit more of a depth of character and remove some of that sort of slightly youthful character but either way whatever they're doing it is damn good ironworks um well yeah absolutely nothing wrong with that at all you know again not a bad um rum um not exactly sort of going to set the world on fire it's like i said it's a kind of a starter it's got some lovely depth to it it's pretty much one dimensional well i'm probably being a bit harsh by saying one dimensional it's not particularly complex um but what it gives you it gives you really quite quite well i think and uh, i i think it's certainly enjoyable so um so there there you have it that's this week's episode of the show in the bag um i hope you've enjoyed it um glad to have finally done a hundred percent canadian episode um so all that's left to say is um Good afternoon and good running.